Good morning, everybody. And, uh, okay. Thank you for your attendance, and thank you for the organizing committee. Today, my topic is about the guidelines of prophylactic in uh, the RCOG guidelines. Uh, but because we are um, overlapping with Dictora uh, Emil, she is also covering a great part of the uh, RCOG guidelines, so I thought, I thought not to be bored by two similar lectures. So I changed it in a way, and some of the topics that I'll be presenting, I will leave it to Dr. Amel to present. So the topic is about reducing the risk of venous thrombosis during pregnancy. I thought before I go into the detail of it, why we say RCOG always, the, we, we uh, uh, rely on the guidelines of RCOG. Does, the impact, does it have an impact, th these guidelines, does it have an impact on the mortality as well as on the morbidity and the well-being and quality of life of the patients? So I thought probably I, I want to share with you kind of the, the, some of the statistics that goes back uh, uh, to 1950, where the incidence death due to bleeding and thrombosis was unacceptably high. And at that time, guideline has been released they has correlated uh, the association between cesarean section and thrombosis. And with a simple just uh, uh, moving the patient, uh, patient around, they could succeed in significantly decreasing the incidence between uh, 1960 to 70 uh, due just only early mobilization. And since then, uh, because all of us during that time, we thought that the most of the, the highest risk of a thrombosis is during the postpartum period, and uh, whether it is normal delivery or postpartum delivery. So most of the guidelines before 2009 were mainly focusing on the, most of the guidelines were mainly focusing on the, uh, uh, on the uh, how to prevent thrombosis postpartum. Until uh, 2009, because of they started kind of what is called, uh, they have uh, uh, investigational kind bodies, the CMAC and the uh, 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 surveillance kind of all the uh, dead cases of patients or due to um, uh, pregnant and pregnancy. They started, any patient dies in, during pregnancy, they investigated her thoroughly. And only then they came up that there are other risk factor that are present antenatally, and that's why we are not succeeding in decreasing the incidence of death. And uh, only the, uh, then they started to publish the uh, guidelines in 2009, 2015, regarding focusing more on this risk factor and how to reduce the risk and prophylactically giving the patient anticoagulant. And they succeeded in a less uh, uh, degree of decreasing the mortality rate during, the, uh, during, the set, uh, during pregnancy. In 2007, uh, they published also a report that highlighting that out of 18 uh, patients, 12 they have, they are obese and their doses, the calculated dose is underdosed. And therefore they might subject it to risk. That's why they, sub they published a detailed, of detailed uh, dose related with the weight of all the anticoagulant uh, available. These are the inquiry the two, uh, that I will be referring to, the CMAC and the EMBRAS. Uh, usually the, the, they have all the causes of the death during pregnancy. I'll go over today about the epidemiology, just tackling on it briefly, and then we, I will take you uh, to understand, I don't want to memorize, do we need to do VTE risk assessment? And if we want to do it, why, when? To, with, to which subject, who to, uh, will be the, supposed we select our patient, and then what we have available as anticoagulant, the dose, and for how long. So to answer why, there are four whys. First, once the patient gets pregnant, she carries the risk, in, the, her risk increases from six up to 10. And as an incidence, it has been shown that the overall incidence of venous thrombosis uh, increase from 0.5 to two per thousand. The pulmonary embolism is a major cause of maternal death, and the fatal pulmonary, fatal pulmonary embolism can account between two to three per hundred thousand. 
DVT is more common in the, the way they present with thrombosis, either arterial or venous. Venous is more common in patients with, uh, in pregnancy, and DVT is three times commoner than the pulmonary embolism, yet they can develop upper, uh, upper arm thrombosis and, other, and pelvic thrombosis. We need to, another why we need to uh, focus on this patient, they present differently than non-pregnant patients. The majority they present with uh, left side, 88% present with left side thrombosis, lower limb thrombosis. And the problem is that 70% of them, they are proximal. What does this mean? The risk of embolization is high. The, uh, the presentation probably with the back pain could be hidden. And this is what created the problem with those patients. So why they run such high risk? We know that they hardly correlated, they fulfill the criteria of Verco's triad because this is the nature. We need a hypercoagulable state for them where the factors are increased and the, there is suppression of the fibrolysis. There is venous stasis and endothelial <coughs> damage. This is the perfect environment for thrombosis, but this is good. This is physiologically good to prevent the bleeding at the time of delivery. And this is evolutionary. So another why we need to start because the presentation of DVT as well as pulmonary embolism is non-specific. They come uh, uh, complaining of uh, tenderness, uh, swelling, and these, uh, or for example, back pain. Uh, pulmonary embolism, the majority, 70% of them, they will present with shortness of breath. This is common, and sometimes most of the pregnant lady they resolve their shortness of breath at the end of the trimester. Therefore, because so the problem is that we need to. Uh, pro protect this group of patients because their symptoms are non-specific, their origin of a thrombosis is pelvic, and the D-dimer which is used in other is not uh, of high uh, uh, specificity and sensitivity in pregnancy. Also, we need to protect them because all of us, we talk about the mortality, the, the DVT, the pulmonary embolism, and how it's affecting the patient during when we see them in the ward or the OPD. But yet we forget about them. What are the uh, long-term complications that can disturb their life? I will talk about this in detail in the next lecture. Another why we need to protect those patients is that the direct association of VTE with the maternal death. We have um, uh, uh, the, the two resources that I show you, the surveillance resource, has shown that there is kind of effort of guidelines published whenever there is increase. They are highlighting on the risk factor, yet you don't see that kind of a drop that is satisfying. There is a drop and then there is increase. There is a drop and there is increase. And when you dig into the detail of these, uh, these, uh, 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 these reports that has been published, you would see that from 2005, still thromboembolic disease is number one cause, pulmonary embolism is number one cause of maternal death. And in 2009, still thromboembolic disease is, or in form of pulmonary embolism, number one death of uh, direct death, uh, cause of maternal death. And even in 2017, 2019, thrombosis is a direct number one cause of a direct maternal mortality. And when I search about all the causes, because we want to get a uh, uh, benefit of what, are, what is the causes, why is there still resistance, for my surprise, the same quote was presented since 2000 up to 2019. Still, the treatment is substandard. The patient is not well covered with the treatment. And the second uh, important is that there was inadequate, despite a very good, excellent risk assessment sheets, guidelines, there is inadequate risk assessment, failure to recognize the symptoms and act on risk factors. Majority of the patients present with shortness of breath, obesity, and they are neglected as a normal uh, uh, thing can happen and patients all of a sudden die. Failure to commence appropriate treatment. The, uh, the, 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 uh, the death related to non-proper care is around 60%, and around 35% they are preventable. And this causes kind of a frustration when you work, you do, and it's yet you don't find the, uh, uh, what you expected. So when is the best? I don't want to memorize when to do. Let's have it in a logic time. In order to grasp it, I will have these two resources. I adore them, and I like to present them during my presentation. One from the CMAC, and the other one is a study. 
The first one is that they have studied the uh, incidence of fatal maternal uh, uh, pulmonary embolism, and they have found that this period of time is the antenatal, and this is the postpartum. To our surprise, 50% of pulmonary embolism occurred in the first trimester, and then to a less extent in the second and then the third trimester. The majority, the more prevalent, it's in the postpartum period, but of importance that you would see, this is not my presentation, this is the wrong one. So anyway, uh, the, I don't want you, I want you only to see this bar, bar. Uh, here is the, uh, it has been found that for cesarean section, the highest risk is uh, during the first week of pregnancy. Later on, the risk with the normal delivery is higher to cause a thrombosis. Important also, they have published, uh, only I want to, to focus on this. They have found that still, right from 1985, when they were, uh, they were publishing their data, there are cases dead from pulmonary embolism, secondary to miscarriage and ectopic pregnancy. So the message is that not all clots are postpartum, and not all clots occur after cesarean section. We need to watch our patients. The second study is that, it, this is a study that done in 2008, it included 600 patient pregnant women, and they have found that they wanted to, do, to study the distribution of a thromboembolism during pregnancy. And again, they have found that 50% of a thrombosis occurred antenatally, and 50% occurred postnatally. And usually started as early as early in, in antenatal first trimester, and in 10% in the first trimester, 10% in the second, and 28% in the third trimester. And 49% of the 49% of the, the thrombosis that occurred postpartum were within the first six weeks of, uh, of uh, postpartum period. And what they have noticed that the relative risk was five times in the antenatal period, 60 times in the postpartum period. This means that highlight that every day in the postpartum period carries a higher risk of a thrombosis. And therefore, those patients need to be taken care of during that period of time. Interestingly, also, they have found that DBT is more common antenatally, whereas pulmonary embolism is more common uh, postnatally. So from this, the message that we want to convey is that all women should undergo VTE risk assessment continuously before pregnancy, during pregnancy, after pregnancy, even if she's admitted five times, do the risk assessment for the patient. And this, the second thing is that don't forget unexpected causes uh, uh, of, of maternal death. Whom should you should uh, 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 screen for or do risk assessment? The uh, RCOG, they published so many important and significant risk factor. We now we know that it's the, the marker of placental insufficiency like preterm, IUGR, preeclampsia, they, are now, they have their weight now in, in, the, in the stratification. Also, so many things has been coming in, bleeding, transfusion. This was not before uh, counted as a risk factor. So for simplicity, they, they, what they divided it into pre-existing, pregnancy-related, and transient. Pre-existing, pre the patients get pregnant with already she's having kind of a thrombosis uh, risk factor. Pregnancy-related, she acquires it during the pregnancy time, and the transient is only for a short time, probably early in the, in the, in the middle or at the end, but it's of only for a short period of time. And it was published brilliantly in the uh, RCOG. I will not go into over it in detail because Dr. Amel will do. But you know, uh, uh, I would like to uh, just go over a few of them. We know that even we noticed that some majority they have one risk factor and 40% they have two risk factor. Among the most important uh, high risk, uh, uh, risk factor in the pre-existence is the previous VTE and non-thrombophilia. They are very high risk when patient with the previous VTE and non-thrombophilia, the patient should be uh, uh, taken care of because she is a very high risk of thrombosis. So the risk of the thrombosis, because in, if a patient who have a previous VTE, the risk of a thrombosis is high, can increase three to four uh, times. And there are things that we have to focus on the thrombosis that is it 
what is the precipitating attack due to? Is it a hormonal? Because then the risk is high, 6%. Is it due to unprovoked or what we call the spontaneous? A patient without any underlying risk factor, risk factor, yet she developed thrombosis. Always a spontaneous thrombosis is a risk factor or a, 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 it should uh, alarm you. And if it is uh, provoked non-hormonal, it is less, the risk of recurrence is much less. So uh, what we do that whenever you have a high, these two high risk, previous uh, unprovoked or hormonal related, then patient should be covered with anticoagulant, antenatally and postnatally. How about the known thrombophilia uh, uh, causes? When we talk about thrombophilia, we talk about two things, congenital and acquired that lupus anticoagulant. So in the thrombophilia, they, it is segregated into low risk and high risk. And the low risk, usually the heterozygous types, especially like factor V Leiden or prothrombin gene mutation. But the high risk is mainly the homozygous. Whenever you have a homozygous, the risk is much higher, especially not only homozygous, if you have a combined kind, two kind of thrombosis. And antithrombin is always, uh, uh, we are uh, alert to it because the risk of a thrombosis is high in condition of antithrombin deficiency. So for those cases, you have to uh, correlate. The family uh, history is important because it can add something or can increase the risk and other time, no. In, uh, in homozygous type, it will not add anything. Those who have a high risk of a thrombosis, you need to cover them. For example, the homozygous, and the combined deficiency with the, with the uh, maternal, uh, the, all of them, you have to cover them antepartum and postpartum. For the heterozygous, you know, depending uh, uh, on the under other risk factor, you have to recall, if it is per se, you don't need to give the patient uh, antenatally because you are subjecting her to unnecessary. But if the patient, she's having a calculated other risk factor, then you have to adjust and probably you need to cover her postpartum. Protein S and protein C, and some of the studies, they push them to the high, others push, push them to the uh, intermediate. Again, look at the uh, history of the patient, the family history, and the underlying risk factor. I will skip the, uh, anti uh, the lupus anticoagulant. I will focus now on the, uh, uh, the BMI. BMI is important. Why is that? Because uh, it is neglected, it is not ca well calculated, and we, fa we are facing problem with it. BMI is highly correlated with the thrombosis. Why? Because the adipocytes itself can produce procoagulant material. Added to that, there is increased in the volume, plasma volume, that to be anticoagulated. There are, so there are two risk factors, or two pathophysiology underlying the uh, obesity and adipocytes that prevent when you give a dose, you still, the dose probably is not adequate. And this has been shown uh, uh, in, a study, in this study, where you see the dark is the, uh, uh, un, uh, the, the, uh, the dose was, un, the patient were, uh, were underdose. So antenatally, you can see mo uh, more than 70% were underdose, whereas the, in the postnatal, 80% of them. And the association of BMI with the cesarean section, then the risk is high, because if you have a BMI high with a cesarean section, then the risk is extended up to six weeks after the, uh, so you don't need to, uh, some, sometimes in the guideline they would say, tell you uh, cover for 10 days, but now you know that the, the risk is, might be extended up to six weeks. Also, uh, of the important uh, uh, obstetric related is that those that related to the markers of placental uh, disease like preeclampsia, stillbirth, preterm, or IUGR, they are now well recognized risk factor for past postpartum uh, VTE. And any woman with low birth weight, they had threefold increased risk of VTE. So uh, uh, there are, uh, I will skip this one because these are other risk factors that they are more and more becoming uh, uh, as a strong risk factor in pregnancy. Uh, 
For the transient, uh, tra uh, transient uh, risk factor, I would focus on what are risk factor present in the first trimester. Because of the cases that see from, uh, from especially the private, it won't mention these three conditions, hyperemesis, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, and IVF pregnancy. A patient with hyperemesis, it has been uh, advised to consider thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight and to discontinue once the patient is, is fine. For ovarian hyperstimulation, thromboprophylaxis should be started during the first trimester. IVF, you need to calculate if there is an associated risk factor, three other risk factors present. Uh, now, also, it has been published that some of the risk factors, they have, they, if they present together, they double the risk factor. Other would uh, uh, multiply it, uh, among which is that a patient with multiple pregnancy and assisted reproduction, they add to each other. They double the risk. Caesarean section and infection can double the risk. Whereas the multiplier are risk factor, if they are alone, they not of that, they have a minor effect. But if they present with another risk factor, the change is high and they inflict harm into the patient. Among, uh, an example of which is the antipartum immobilization and elevated body mass index, which might increase the uh, VTE risk up to 40 times. Uh, these were uh, brilliantly uh, uh, explained in RCUG. I will not go, Dr. Uh, Amel will do. And uh, so what anticoagulant and dose we have, we have now uh, uh, good drugs that available can be used for a pregnant lady. And these are uh, safe, effective, and uh, uh, they are including low molecular weight, unfractionated, and denaporoid. So what dose you would use? Uh, this will be discussed with Dr. Emil. So this is nice to mention because this is a study. What is the appropriate dose? Would you use in the patient antenatal and postnatal low prophylactic or high prophylactic? This is a study called the high-low study. It was published in the last EHA in, uh, in last summer. Uh, this is the first international uh, investigational uh, open-label randomized control trial. They, uh, they, uh, they included more than 1,000 with a history of VTE, and they randomized them between low and intermediate. The, what they found is that uh, during antipartum, it's okay. There is no difference between the two, if you use low or intermediate. Whereas in the postpartum, it's better to go for the intermediate dose because this is more effective in lowering the pulmonary embolism, the VTE superficial thrombo. How long would it use? You know, and the guideline will be discussed today with Dr. Amel. It is stated uh, very well that uh, uh, for high-risk cases, you, you can go up to six. And not only six, you might extend it to three months, depending on the case. And for low, ca low uh, cases, uh, low-risk cases, you might uh, start from 10 days. It's about, uh, it depends on the case. So in summary, we are discussing about the tenfold increase in VTE in pregnancy and seven days after delivery is the highest risk. VTE risk stays elevated for six weeks postnatally, but in some, or some cases might extend up to three months. Uh, it's worth mentioning that despite all the effort, still pulmonary embolism is a leading cause of maternal death, and this is the, the number of patients died. So I thought it's, uh, it's, it will be more important to, to uh, to end my lecture with a recommendation after all this ex extensive effort that has been done in UK. They said that risk assessment as early as possible in pregnancy is a must. You sh more than 50% their, their care were suboptimal, 50% not compliant to the RCOG, and 50% of the, of the women, they were not risk assessed with and or their uh, dose were suboptimal. There was 50% death in the first trimester, and you have to focus, uh, uh, not every shortness of breath is a normal presentation or back pain is a normal presentation. Avoid late and missed doses because there are, uh, a couple of patients died in their registry because there was a delay in starting the, the treatment. And when you prescribe full course of low molecular weight for postpartum period uh, uh, from the secondary care should be uh, uh, maintained. This is true in our patient and in the registry. Patient died because she was given only for a, a brief time, uh, probably a week, and she needed six weeks of treatment. Thank you, Dr. Najat. Just I want to mention about the 
I need your experience regarding this. If the patient, pregnant lady, got cesarean section, uh, do you consider this is related to the pregnancy? So next pregnancy, you need to put her in DVT antibartum, postpartum. No DVT during after the cesarean section. So I used to give those patient, I consider this is related to the surgery, not the pregnancy. So next pregnancy, usually I give postpartum DVT prophylaxis. In your experience here, do you consider this is related to the pregnancy? So next pregnancy, antibartum and postpartum needed or only related to the surgery and postpartum needed? Uh, thank you for your question. Out of my experience, sometimes I don't follow guidelines. Usually, I dig more into the history of the patient, especially with cesarean section, if there was an associated other risk factor at that time. Uh, and still, I would redo the risk assessment during the next pregnancy. I would not give her during uh, uh, the full antenatal period. I would consider probably the postnatal still. I will dig more. Uh, uh, a family history, I know you would do all these things, but uh, probably I will, depending on the case, yani one case probably I will give, other case I will not give, you see? But in general, I do protect them, and it depends. Is, was this an emergency kind of uh, uh, cesarean section or it's an elective? With emergency, the risk is much higher, so I do cover them with the anticoagulant of the patient. And uh, you will see, uh, if you are attending the next lecture, uh, in, in Kuwait, I'm not f quite following the RCOG because we have in our, um, uh, in our society different culture of uh, postpartum immobility, postpartum dehydration. So usually any patient with cesarean section, I would cover her because I don't trust her. Not because uh, 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 RCOG, uh, uh, the guidelines said so. Because look at your uh, families, they are running postpartum, you don't know what is hidden behind the doors. So in general, majority, yani, I would say 70%, if not 80% of them, I would cover them. Then I don't trust what they are doing at home. As a department policy, I think all over the maternity units in uh, Kuwait, and I can say from Farwania that I'm working with, uh, we give all the cesarean sections, the postpartum prophylaxis, all of them, regardless whatever they had. If she, this patient in particular, has developed a, a DVT or a thrombosis effect event after the cesarean section, uh, she will receive prophylaxis. But if it is something additional risk factors, only the things is duration, how much duration she will be. Yeah, only during hospital stay, 10 days, six weeks, that will depend on the risk assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Doctora. And I think that we have um, touched a very important point on why implementation of certain guidelines, um, we have a problem uh, locally in implementing. Now, my question to you is, um, in order to ensure that a proper guideline is implemented, do you believe that we should develop a local guideline based on the current culture, or should we train our patients to follow the guidelines? Like, like you said, um, you don't trust what they do at home, but should we push them towards implementing? Because the latest um, trend now is involving patients in the implementation process. And we just finished a very um, um, fruitful uh, workshop on the, the, the science of implementation, and the key is involving patients. So we are looking at two different sides. So we involve the patient. We, we, I wouldn't say force, but we encourage them to implement the, the best practice available, or should we modify our guidelines in order to, to match their lives? Uh, well, um, uh, the thing is that uh, already the postpartum cesarean section thromboprophylaxis is implemented in our hospital. So it is part of it and part of the indicator that we are following. Uh, because of the, uh, I think the, the international guidelines are more toward uh, cost effective and how much we are spending to that. You get my point? So, uh, uh, you can modify it in a way 
uh, you can do, uh, you can follow, because once we will follow, we will follow the majority of it. It's just a couple of sentences, probably you will modify it to your, uh, to your, like COVID, for example. We've been involved with putting the plans and guidelines for COVID. For me, COVID, it, because at that time when COVID came, COVID is still a new thing. Nobody is experienced or, or, or genius in COVID. All, all of us, we went, we've been experimenting on our patient. I, a pregnant lady with a COVID anticoagulant, low, low dose anticoagulant, and sent her home. So you can adjust it, whereas if you attend the webinar outside, they would recommend no, go for the moderate, uh, intermediate, high risk. Yes, you can modify depending on what is you are seeing and once you are involved. The second thing regarding the involving the patient in education, yes, 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 10 times yes. Because you will see in our presentation that sometimes it's not enough that you teach, you give, and go home. You will be surprised, they stop treatment. The compliance of the treatment in the hospital is 100%, and it dropped dramatically at home, because either they skip doses, or they shorten the period, or, for example, finished and she doesn't want to give. And she subject to herself, we will we'll show you today uh, two couple of, uh, of, of cases where they develop thrombosis because of that. We need to, uh, this is now, uh, it, it was always our priority to teach our patient. Yes, they need to be involved. And I want one of them in the believers. They need to be involved in all my decision. I like to counsel them. I like to show them I'm doing that because if anything happened the way I said it, I, I put my risk, for example, you probably will develop a bleeding. Once she developed, because I said to her, she will not be surprised. She will not be disappointed with my treatment. And I like to involve the patient with our, yes. Uh, 